Hey football fans and welcome to The Coordinator Project. In this video, we're looking at Cal's 2020 defensive collaboration between Justin Wilcox, Peter Sermon, and Tim DeRuiter, but I'll be hitting every Power 5 play caller between now and September, so be sure to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell to get notified whenever a new breakdown posts. The 2020 Bear defense was unique in having three coaches with significant defensive coordinator experience on staff, and all of them had something to do with designing the defense. Starting at the top, head coach Justin Wilcox is the CEO of the whole thing. Cal's his first head coach job, and he got it after spending the previous decade as a coordinator at Wisconsin, USC, Washington, Tennessee, and Boise State. Early in his career, he worked as a position coach under current Washington defensive coordinator Bob Gregory, and during this period, Gregory was still running a lot of 4-3 stuff, and Wilcox did the same in his early D.C. positions at Boise and Tennessee. By the time he got to Washington in 2012, though, he'd branched out to do his own thing, going with more of a hybrid 3-4 base nickel look, with guys like Shaq Thompson at Washington or Sua Cravens at USC playing a sort of a hybrid safety outside linebacker position. While Wilcox is the man at the top, he's never been the primary play caller at Cal, and in 2020, that title fell to Peter Sermon. Wilcox and Sermon have been kind of joined at the hip since their playing days at Oregon, where they both played in the same defense and were part of the same graduating class. After graduation, Sermon went on to a six-year NFL career with the Titans, and Wilcox went almost immediately into coaching, but shortly after Sermon's playing days ended, he joined Wilcox as a GA at Tennessee and followed him in his stops at both Washington and USC before becoming a defensive coordinator in his own right, first at Mississippi State and then at Louisville, where he ran the same kind of hybrid defense that he coached with Wilcox at USC and Washington. The third and final play caller in this trio was Tim DeRuiter, who was Cal's primary defensive coordinator from 2017 to 2019 before swapping roles with Sermon in 2020. While well, Wilcox and Sermon have traditionally run more of a base nickel hybrid 3-4 at their other stops, DeRuiter's more of an old school 3-4 guy, and he's run this as his base defense at least since his days at Navy in the late 90s. In spite of the fact that Sermon had the defensive coordinator title in 2020, Cal still ran this more traditional 3-4 look as their base package, and when it comes to this particular look, DeRuiter was definitely the expert on the staff. In terms of personnel, this is a system that works best with three massive defensive linemen in the middle of the formation, with a nose tackle over the center and defensive ends over the offensive tackles. It then plays with two outside linebackers on the edges, and then two inside linebackers stacked behind the defensive line to man the second level. In a classic 3-4, all of these guys are generally going to be bigger than their counterparts in other defenses, and in fact, under DeRuiter at Cal, they often use converted defensive linemen to fill some of their linebacker spots, both at inside linebacker and at outside linebacker. So this is going to be a much heavier package than a lot of defenses nowadays, which instead look to emphasize versatility and getting a lot of speed on the field. The three defensive linemen need to be big because they're trying to command double teams and prevent blockers from getting up to the second level. The outside linebackers have to have both the length and the athleticism to rush the passer and the size to hold the edge in the run game, and the inside linebackers have to be ready to take on any offensive linemen that might leak up to them. I've already talked about this and shown some examples in my Colorado video, so I won't repeat that here, but if you want to see some film on this kind of defense, you can click the link in the upper right-hand corner of this video. I've just highlighted the fact that this front requires a lot of size to truly play it well, and that's reflected in how Cal used this package. For this video, I've broken down Cal's games versus Oregon, Oregon State, and Stanford, and in those games, the Bears were only in base 3-4 personnel about 20% of the time, and that's because they really only used it to defend either stuff with multiple tight ends or some two-back formations. Since these formations aren't all that common in this spread-dominated era of football, Cal ended up spending a lot of time in things other than their base 3-4 defense. The most common of these was a set that left three defensive linemen on the field, but subbed out the strong side outside linebacker and replaced him with a nickelback. Cal used this grouping 43% of the time in the games that I broke down, making it more than twice as common as the base 3-4. This was really their workhorse formation in 2020, and the Bears ran a lot of different things out of it, reminding me a lot of the hybrid 3-4 defenses that Wilcox and Sermon ran at Washington and USC. So, now that we know who Cal had on the field in 2020, let's look at some plays to see how they used these players. The first thing to know about Cal's defense is that they were a big zone coverage team. The world of zone coverage is large and diverse, but within that broad spectrum, Cal's coverage has tended more toward a classic spot-dropping landmark zone, although there were some mild matchup elements that allowed them to jump certain routes more aggressively. Let's start with the spot-dropping part of this description. In a classic spot-dropping zone, your underneath defenders are going to drop to a particular landmark roughly 10 to 12 yards deep, and then they're going to read the quarterback's eyes and shoulders to know when to break on the ball. After the snap on this play, we're going to see this at work with the underneath coverage defenders here. 
After the snap, Oregon State's going to hit them with a little play action fake, but once these defenders get their pass read, they're getting into pretty typical zone drops. So the weak side linebackers dropping straight down the hash, the strong side linebackers dropping to the middle of the field, and the nickelbacks dropping to a spot just outside the far hash where he's prepared to widen with any receiver that threatens him outside. Having success in this kind of coverage relies to a large degree on the drops and the discipline of those underneath defenders. The goal of this kind of zone is to get an even distribution across the width of the field so that a receiver can no sooner clear one of those defenders than he's running into another one, and we can see that at work with this receiver up here at the top of the screen. If he breaks outside, there's a cornerback there. If he breaks inside, there's a linebacker dropping down the hash, and if he works across the field, there's another linebacker waiting for him in the middle of the field. No matter where he goes, if the quarterback does try to throw it to him, he's going to have all of those defenders converging on him really fast. From this picture, we can really see the importance of the drops and the discipline of these zone defenders. For example, if this linebacker in the middle of the field were to drift off of his landmark, maybe chasing the tight end to the outside or something like that, then he'd open up a big throwing lane in the middle of the field and wouldn't be able to make up that distance while the ball was in the air. In this kind of defense, then, you don't necessarily have to have great coverage athletes at all of your linebacker positions because you're not asking those guys to run with receivers man-to-man. -man. Instead, it's much more important that they understand the team defense side of this and have a good feel for the game to know what exactly they need to take away and when they need to turn and run. Now on this play, we get a pretty ideal zone picture, but good passing games aren't just going to concede all of this, and it's important to understand how offenses are going to go after these zone coverages. On this next play, we'll be able to learn a little bit more about the matchup elements in Cal's defense, while also seeing what kinds of things offenses will do to try and attack it. The first thing to notice here is that for Cal, zone coverage doesn't necessarily mean soft or off coverage. So this is a third and four, and as we can see, Cal has no problem pressing their cornerbacks to make sure that Oregon can't complete an easy slant or a hitch. They won't always do this, but the key is that they've got coverages where they can do it, and that gives them answers to keep them from getting killed underneath. The second thing to notice here is that even on the inside, Cal's linebackers aren't just going to drop robotically to a 10 to 12 yard depth to play zone. That'd obviously be stupid on third and four, so here we're going to see Cal's linebackers playing with a little bit more of a matchup technique. On this play, Oregon's bringing their slot receiver up here on a shallow cross, and so this linebacker, instead of dropping to 10 to 12 yards and letting that guy run underneath him for an easy first down, is going to jump this route. We can see the same thing on the opposite side here where the other linebackers seen the running back leak out of the backfield on a check down and so he's jumping that route as well. Cal zone defense isn't just a drop and rally defense then but it gives its defenders a little bit more latitude to attack receivers that threaten their zones. The only problem here is that no matter how you play these guys there are some things that zone coverages will just always be susceptible to and on this play Oregon's illustrating this with a zone overload. Here's the basic problem. When these two linebackers stay wide and shallow to defend these two routes underneath, they give up a lot of space in the middle of the field between them and behind them, and on this play, Oregon's able to attack that soft spot by running a third receiver over the middle. This route combination creates a three-on-two triangle over those linebackers, making them wrong no matter what they do. If they come up to take away the easy throws at the sticks, as they've done on this play, then that's going to open up the intermediate middle for the third receiver at the top of the triangle. But if one of them drops to take away that intermediate route, then he'll have to abandon his short route, giving up an easy check down in the first down. No matter what technique you use in your zone coverage, then two guys can never defend three, and good passing attacks will use this against you if you play a lot of zone. So if you're a zone team, how do you solve this problem? Cal's answer was to have a pretty robust zone coverage package with a variety of secondary rotations and a good amount of disguise mixed in. The idea here is to show the defense an opening like the one that we just saw, and then to fill that space with somebody unexpected. So on the last play against Oregon, we saw Cal give up something over the middle, and here Stanford's trying to attack that space with a levels concept. And for more on this levels concept, you can check out my video on Stanford's offense at the link at the upper right hand corner of this video. On this play, the Bears are going to show that same void in the intermediate middle of the field by playing a nickel bear front with five guys on the line of scrimmage and then blitzing the only second level linebacker that they've got left, creating a massive opening in the middle of the field. At the last second though, we're going to see them spin their safeties into a robber coverage. So the guy up here at the top of the screen is going to bail out to cover the deep middle of the field and the weak safety is going to spin down into the intermediate hole to rob any crossing route that might be coming his way, taking away that soft spot that we saw Oregon target on the previous play. Now, when you use zone coverages like this to solve most of your problems, another big element of your defense will always be the zone blitz. Zone blitzes can be used to bring five-man pressures, and Cal did do that about 10% of the time in the games that I studied in 2020, but a much more characteristic look is to bring one unexpected rusher, either from the linebacker core or from the secondary, and then to drop somebody else out of the pass rush and into coverage, as we're going to see on this play right here. Here, Cal's weak side linebacker is going to blitz, and then the outside linebacker lined up to the opposite side of the formation is going to drop to replace his number in coverage. 
purely in terms of pressure on this play, the blitz is a nice touch. We can see here that it lets Cal get a linebacker matched up one-on-one -on -one against a running back in pass protection, and that element does end up spooking the quarterback and forcing him to try and scramble, but the pressure itself isn't anything special or exotic here. What Cal did really well, though, is that they used these blitzes as a way to move numbers around and keep the defense guessing. For example, on this play, if the outside linebacker rushes off the edge, it looks like there's going to be a lot of open space in between the nickelback and this inside linebacker, and Stanford is in fact targeting that area with the same levels concept that we saw before. Pressure aside then, what Cal's really doing with this blitz is allowing their strong side outside linebacker to insert in coverage, taking away that space that Stanford's trying to attack underneath. Meanwhile, the blitzing linebacker to the opposite side lets Cal keep a four-man pass rush, so while Cal can use their blitz game to bring a little bit more heat, their pressure packages really fit much more closely with the coverage disguises that we saw earlier, and it's just another way that they can make things tough for the quarterback to sort out. When this is how you like to problem solve on defense, it obviously puts more of a burden onto your play caller and puts less of it on the individual athletic ability of your defenders. It is much more important for players to understand what you're trying to do and to execute their role as a unit within that system, trusting that the defensive coordinator's calls are going to put them in the right position to make plays. All right, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, you might consider hitting the thumbs up button down below to like it. The more likes, the more YouTube will recommend these videos to other people, so it really helps to support the channel. Also, if there's a coordinator that you really want to see, let me know in the comments and I'll see what I can do. Otherwise, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to get notified whenever a new breakdown goes up, and I'll see you here next time.